So my, my wonderful structure is before, during, and after. Um, and I just wanna, I do wanna start by very much saying, uh, actually even on camera, is that, if I hope that's rolling, um, is that Joel's document, his, his preaching uh, booklet thing, is absolutely brilliant and i hope by the time this is on on air or whatever online that it's 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 published as a book because i think it's superb and uh my my humble offering is very much in the context of uh making sure hopefully you guys have read um joel's thing which is to be honest with you just theologically you know in a different league this is in, this is very much a personal walk so i felt slightly awkward doing it but basically i had you know various people saying oh can I talk to you about how you do it? And I thought, well, it might be easier for me just to kind of um, just summarise it um, and then capture it so that at least it's online and people can who who are interested can therefore look at it. Um, and I do want to again say that there's many of you here who I know who who would have a different way of doing it. This isn't the right way. This is just a way I found helpful. And certainly it's not original. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Very nice. Oh, you, you might want to keep that, actually. It's quite quite nice. So, okay, let's just let's just jump in. I'm just going to walk through it. The other thing is, please ask questions, all right? I know it's been video, but just forget about that. That's just for kind of reference. Please do ask questions genuinely, because I just put this down as, 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 as well as I could, but I'm sure I've forgotten some things. Um, let me just pray, and then we'll jump in. Father, thank you so much for preaching. Thank you so much, Father, for uh, opening up your word. I pray God help me now, just as we look at this, to really, um, I pray, hear your heart. I pray, Lord God, we'll hear your heart. And I pray people won't feel straight jacketed. They won't think, oh, I've got to do everything here. I pray they'll take the bits that are right for them and they'll leave the rest. Amen. All right. Uh, okay. So first of all, just some very obvious things, but it's worth stating the obvious. Um, you know, when you first get a, a bit of scripture, uh, just to say as a throwaway comment, my dad thinks most New Frontiers churches are mad. Loads of this is going to refer to my dad, just so you know that, because he's a brilliant preacher and I've learned loads from him. So, uh, dad, love you. Um, uh, first of all, uh, preaching on a huge, chunky passage generally provides a lot more challenges than pre you know, preaching on a single text, which is why often some of the greats like Lord Jones and others tend to kind of, you know, have a more of a bite sized thing. So even the way we've historically done it, I think, has not always lent itself to people growing in preaching as you've got this huge swathe of, 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 of scripture you're trying to get through. Um, so I think more and more, I've, I've really enjoyed the whole series on the Sermon on the Mount, partly because we've just done one verse. Because I think, you know, obviously scripture is so meaty, actually, to have that chance to meditate on it. But when you're given either a verse or a huge swathe, um, just some obvious things. First of all, uh, find a quiet space uh, when you first read it. And that sounds obvious, but I think it's really important. I think most of us have very busy lives. I think some of us here have got kids and just uh, hectic lives. I think the way we approach scripture actually really matters. Do you know what I'm saying? It's actually a faith element. You can read it as kind of a helpful thing um, and often read it in a way that kind of you bring to it um, your own presuppositions. And oh, I know this passage, or you can approach it as the holy, perfect word of God which I know Driscoll says, you don't, you don't, we don't stand on the word, you come under the word. And I, and I think therefore it's really imp important, particularly if you're going to proclaim it, that you do your very best to almost approach it with a reverence, with a, a sense of, I am not coming here and I've got my agenda. This is going to, this is going to, the scripture do the heavy lifting. The scripture has got to uh, speak for itself. That's what we're trying to do is we're actually trying to say, what, what was this scripture originally about? And therefore when you approach it, I want to just right away say, do it in a way that even physically, you know, we are physical as we're spiritual beings. We're not just spiritual, physical uh, atmosphere, physical uh, culture and the way in which you approach it really matters. So I'd say try and find somewhere that is quiet, that is going to actually be conducive to um, you hearing from God. We are a prophetic people. And, um, and that's one of the key things, therefore, that when you get to the scripture, uh, doing it in a place which is uh, quiet. Read scripture first before commentaries, obvious point. Oh, we're in order. Questions, Questions already. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Again, already you start with the assumption that you are going to be given a passage to speak on. Yeah. There is obviously the whole about giving a topic to speak yes. on. And whether you want to say, oh, I'll handle that separately. Or if your starting point is topic, someone says, I can speak on God's guidance, for instance. Yes. Would that be a slightly different starting point in terms of rather than if you've got a passage to work from? I think it's a really good point. I think, I think what I'll quickly, quickly say, say just, just for the sake, sake of time, time Personally, Personally, I think I you could almost apply that to be honest with you, aside from preaching, whenever you approach scripture. So my basic thought is I'm daily filling myself 
building a reservoir of truth. And the point with that, I guess, is almost that I'm not coming to a, a, tr a, a passage in Leviticus trying to make it immediately applicable. I'm trying to fully understand what was, why did God include this in the Bible? What's this about? So if, if that is your, your, your default position is daily filling, filling, filling for yourself, when you then come to a topic, actually the spirit will bring to, to birth, as it were, he'll bring to remembrance the things that you've worked hard at, getting an understanding, first of all, what it originally was about. Even if you think, I don't know how this isn't going to apply to my life right now. It's amazing that discipline of daily doing it means that then when suddenly you have a theme or something, the spirit will go, remember that obscure passage in Malachi or whatever, and you've got it kind of more packaged. So I don't know if that helps in terms of answering what you're saying, but... Um, Read the scripture first before commentary. That's a hugely important thing. Um, I'm, I really, really love commentaries. I'm a huge, I just think they're brilliant. But it's really important that you, I mean, just even from a, um, an ethical point of view, uh, there's a brilliant uh, blog entry on the Gospel Coalition website at the moment about plagiarism and about the real need to be careful about that. And uh, uh, Carson and Tim Keller do some really helpful comments about that. And I think they just 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 keep that on the agenda that, it, you know, uh, I think it's right to you use and utilize other people's co comments and thoughts, but that we do it in a way that is really full of integrity. Particularly, I think, therefore, read the scripture first, have faith that this isn't just the perfect word of God, but he will speak to you. He really will speak to you. And that's why I think one of the key things is I'll try and be reading ahead of a, a sermon, weeks ahead of it, weeks, um, so that you're marinating in it. The most frustrating thing in the world is when you've had your moment, you've preached, and then in the coming week, you realize all these other things you could have said. Now, I think to a degree that kind of always happens, but I think... <clears throat> that's why I'll often say, if you're going to preach at City, I'd love to see your notes or you'll preach it to me at least a week or if not two weeks beforehand. Because I think unless obviously there's no practical way that can happen, most of us, we can start just meditating on it and applying it to ourselves. So read the scripture first. I like to meditate. Different versions uh, is obviously really helpful. Enough said on that. Pray and trust he will guide. The Bereans, um, in the book of Acts, obviously, Tim often talks about this. Uh, the Bereans were those who searched the scriptures. They wrestled with what Paul was saying. They didn't just sort of swallow it whole. And they used uh, their minds and their will and their emotions. They used all of who they were to really get to the heart of what the truth is about. And then um, the final thing on this before you actually jump in is the context. And I've said at the whole Bible level, the book level, and the passage level. So just basically... <clears throat> you know the aim is to be serving the people in whatever context you're in with not just a nice little truth but it's it's showing them the big story all the time trying to help them to understand ultimately this isn't about your needs being met this is about you getting connected with the greatest story the world's ever known his story of which you have a valuable part of but actually it's about his big story and therefore the scripture isn't used to serve the needs but actually is to show the person's valuable role in this amazing big story that's happening and breaking it down therefore to how that book fits into it and how the passage around it fits into the exact context uh, and sets the context rather for the exact passage that you're speaking of. Okay, so just a few obvious things. Can I ask a yeah, of course, yeah. Um, in terms of commentaries, yeah. are there specific like series of commentaries that you would recommend as being really valuable mm -hmm. yeah. or ones that you would say to avoid? I might, I'll, I'll ask Derek to comment on this in a minute, minute but I, I think, think my kind of, of the most, most obvious, obvious thing to say probably is the BST series, series The Bible Speaks Today, which I think John Stott's the series editor for, are generally very good. The yellow ones, and then I think they're orangey and green for the Old Testament. They're generally, I think, really, they're kind of, you know, you won't go too far wrong with those. Um, Derek, do you want to comment on other commentary series that you think are worthy of note? Yeah, um, I think that the World Biblical Biblical commentary series, yeah. uh, from a more technical point of view, yeah. is excellent. Um, and so is the New International Commentary on the Old and New Testament, right. two series. Okay. Um, uh, as, uh, as overall series, this is, yeah. you know, when you're talking about series, they're generalising yes. badly, yeah. because you get good and bad yes. within a series. Do, yeah. um, 
a website I was actually going to recommend when I was talking about Joseph uh, is bestcommentaries.com. Right. Okay. And you will find some excellent suggestions for right. commentaries there. Right. So that's well worth knowing about. Fantastic. Thank you, Derek. Brilliant. All right, well, let's, let's just jump, jump into the actual, actual preparing, preparing itself, itself then. then. So, so um, um, again, again, this is a little bit... bit a little bit not in perfect order, so please forgive me for that, but hopefully it will kind of flow. First of all, then, um, as soon as I start with this, some of you preachers will go, I don't agree with this, but that's fine. This is just my personal convictions. One main point, all right? I personally believe in that. This is a great book, which anyone can borrow if they want, or buy. I would really recommend this buying. Andy Stanley, who leads a, a great big church in America, he's produced a book which is quite fun, cl cleverly titled Communicating for a Change. It's obviously two meanings there, which I'm sure you can work out. But his, his main point really, to be honest with you, is have one point which sounds obvious, um, but certainly was, again, what my dad always rammed into my kind of thinking is um, as best as you can, what is the main point of the passage you're looking at or the scripture? What is, what is wrestling with that? So that when someone says to you, what is your sermon about? You, you, you basically can explain it in one concise, hopefully well-crafted title. I haven't put down here titles. I really actually believe in titles. The difference in my soul when I've got a title right to when I haven't done, or even subpoints, using of language is so important, particularly if you're someone who's a bit like me, who tends to be quite kind of, uh, you know, um, free and easy. So I don't, you, as you'll see later, I tend to kind of, you know, I think, therefore working hard on the structure that you can do. I mean, I know Bill Heibel says that he's wrestled for entire plane journeys with working out what one word is try to get one word right for a vision statement or a sermon. And I think I, I can identify with that. You don't want to overpush that. But I think personally, um, if you can do that, crafting of language is so important and the difference it can inspire in your heart. So, for example, as you probably know, I'm sure, at the moment as a church, we've got these four main kind of values, one of which is uh, becoming gospel drenched, second one seeing widespread discipleship. Before I added the words gospel drenched, and widespread discipleship. It was just, you know, sort of something like we want to be strong in the gospel and, you know, make sure discipleship happens. When I, when I felt God give me the word gospel drenched, suddenly it was like, oh, you know, there was that sort of, oh, I can imagine being drenched and it had power. And then suddenly I wanted to tell everyone about it or widespread discipleship. Because actually we've had pocketed discipleship for years, people, you know, getting organically together. But the idea of widespread that everyone in the church will be expecting to both disciple and be discipled, put a fire in my soul. Do you see what I'm saying? So the, the use of words is important. But back to the main point, one main point, I'd, I would really think most people with busy lives need to walk away from a sermon and I know what that main point was about. But secondly, having a maximum, I would normally say, of three points about that point. So... So I give an example here. This is uh, I prepared this a little while ago, and I used um, it was it was in the in the Drench series. I talked about joy, uh, joy coming from the spirit. So my main point was basically that Christians should be joyful. Okay, and my main, my three main points about it were sin drains joy. Uh, God, secondly, God is the joy giver. And thirdly, Christ's return will signal joy eternal. So I normally make a reference in each of the points uh, to the main point linguistically. So you can see there the word joy. I want everyone to be knowing exactly where they're going. Now, we're all different. We are, I can't say this enough. Some don't really care about structure, and that's fine. I personally find it very helpful if the, sermon, if the person preaching tells me where they're going so I know all the time how the point they're telling me isn't just a nice point, but it links with the big picture. Why do I need to care about sin? Why do I need to care about Christ's return? Well, because it's telling me about the bigger thing, which is joy. Does that make sense? So I try to literally use the same word um, in the sub points so that it helps me to actually um, uh, to communicate to the guys who are listening this is this is still part of the same point we haven't just suddenly gone off on a little beaten track okay um, point are in me not naturally liking structure but key if you're going to get people to remember anything okay I think that's really true we've got a little illustration here um, I had um, I had about a year ago, I think it was, I had Chimenea out in the garden one evening with a guy in the church. And without, I, without in any way him trying to suck up to me, he ended up quoting about eight or nine of my sermons back to me. Uh, not the whole sermon, clearly, but 
phrases that I'd use, like gutsy givers or other stuff. And, I, and these are from years ago. And I was blown away. And I just, it just, I thought God say, be encouraged, Tom. The, you know, uh, sometimes the structuring thing, the alliteration is a bit cheesy. And you and your structure can become too dominating. I totally understand that. But if it serves the main point, people can actually, as well as having their hearts stirred, need to have their minds informed and, and remembering things will really help. So that was a real encouragement about using um, structure that is clearly linguistically connected to the main point. I'll touch upon um, the use of language a bit more in a moment. Fourthly, the blend of light and heat. What I mean by that is just simply that, uh, it's another way of putting it, that a sermon should include both. Light being scriptural truth that brings illumination to the mind okay that your mind oh i didn't know that before uh but also heat that there's a stirring of the heart stirring of passion and often you'll find uh that you might naturally lean more towards one rather than the other so for example stories and illustrations often bring a lot of heat a lot of emotion and that's good but if you're just all that the people will go oh wow and then about two days later but i had no idea what it was about but i got very stirred so i think i'm i'm convinced personally that it it's a, is a blend of the two i've just no, noticed something down here that i've occurred to me recently people's faces will tend to be weird when you're bringing light and probably more responsive when you're bringing heat. So I, I often when you're telling people something they have to think about and they have to wrestle with in their minds, they'll often sit there going, you know, or sort of some really weird expression uh, to the point where you almost want to go, can I just stop? Excuse me, Jim, are you okay? You know, um, and that's a huge spiritual, I just say that's a big element when you're growing and preaching of realizing that people's faces can be the most off-putting thing but i think they're often connected with if you're someone if the, the sermon if the sermon's about a lot of in that moment is about light so trying to get them to understand that something about the gospel and it's quite kind of almost quite philosophical or quite theologically deep people's resting faces will often be quite off-putting because they're thinking but then you come to an illustration which is all about funny or all dramatic and they'll either be crying or they'll be laughing and suddenly you feel at peace again because you know you're connecting so i just say ride that out it's okay uh, some of my the preachers i listen to most are very very good at the light so for, i love my bets i listen to loads of my bets but i rarely um, you know laughing out loud with with laughter or crying loads is not he's not massively into heat in that sense but he's just one of the most anointed light bringers that i know Does that makes sense and you'll probably find that you're more one or the other and that's fine but i've noticed for me when i pre when i'm bringing something that's going to be about more kind of approaching the mind that's i think don't worry if everyone looks a bit weird um because often they wake up a bit when you're when you're bringing more of a heat thing um, trust the spirit is work that uh, is at work okay each point needs to have three ingredients <clears throat> so say you have three points about your one main point then each 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 one of those three points needs to have three ingredients uh number one exegesis number two application number three illustration in that order i would say so basically number one exegesis what does the scripture what did it originally mean there's nothing worse than when someone preaches and they don't tell you about that passage you know, they preach it. And so tell the people what they need to understand. What does that passage, you know, what, what's it about? What, what was happening? What was the context? Work hard at understanding. You want to smell the flame. You want to smell what was it like when Paul was at the Aragopagus. You know, paint the picture because the Bible, just telling people about the Bible. I mean, I remember listening to one of Derek's preachers online about Mark, and he just spent a long time painting the picture of Mary going to the tomb. And I think he said something about going to Tesco's or, you know, the equivalent. And it was just like, I was like, yeah, I was right there. And so I think work hard um, at uh, bringing the, the exegesis so that you're with integrity uh, showing the point you've made your point so for example in that illustration uh that that sin drains joy and then you bring the scripture that shows that yes yeah? so your main point is okay, sin drains joy this is why because if you see here in verse seven it says duh, 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 okay help them to understand secondly though application so then you're saying the question here is so what okay that's the, the question that you're answering. You've told me this, Tom, but so what? The application, therefore, is the applying of it into every different people group you can possibly think of. Now, of course, you won't do that with every point. You'll pick and choose. And often this is where the prophetic comes in, where you're saying, Lord, help me. And this is where the shepherding heart comes in. So it might be in TGR, or it might be in, in, in youth work, or it might be on a Sunday or in vision. And you're thinking, oh, Lord, you know, for cell leaders 
or for people with marriages in difficulty or singles? How are they going to respond to this? Why is it important for them to know this point? So that's application. Thirdly, illustration. That's a story um, which then illustrates the application. Like the, it illustrates, for example, here uh, the point um, about, so if I've said that sin drains joy, you've then told everyone why that's important. And then you've given a story that illustrates <laughs> why that is. Okay, I'm going quite quick because we've got stuff to get through. Um, All sorts of problems as a consequence. Right. So that the exegesis then depends on the application and even right. the illustration. Wow. And that's wrong. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Derek. That's encouraging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so for me, uh, why biblically I can argue sin is... Uh, okay, so I'm giving the illustration here. Um, brilliant. Thank you, Derek. Yeah. That's encouraging. <laughs> yeah, on camera. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so for me, uh, why biblically I can argue sin is... Uh, okay, so I'm giving the illustration here. Um, yeah. I think that's all kind of fine. Okay, point seven. Little little comment about ten, about tension and about uh, intro. I personally think now this is where I think um, not to be too uh, technical, but uh, this book here, Explosive Preaching, which is incredibly easy to read. It's got the weirdest cover I know, <laughs> but it is a brilliant, brilliant book, and I would genuinely recommend you all to buy it. Okay, he talks. It's a brief history of all different preaching types and styles, and I thought I just bought it because I thought I should, and I was like, oh, this is brilliant really easy to read <clears throat> and in one of the best sections the great preaching he talks about um the, the history of preaching and the different forms of it um and there's two particular forms i won't read them all out there's uh, such ones as the scholastic deductive form the moral essay form um but he, he also talks here about a couple of forms that i think are important and here one of them he talks about is something called the liberal inductive form now what this is it basically means that you're trying to um, build attention in the listener that you then answer. So it starts with the introduction. You need people to want to hear, listen to your sermon, right? I want to go amen, but amen. You know, you want people to go, oh, this is like scintillating. This is practical. This is life-changing. This is so relevant for me. You don't want them sitting there going, well, this is in interesting information, but how does this apply? Therefore, in the introduction, you have got to build in them a hunger, Okay. You're trying to produce a hunger, a tension. The way I put it is this. You, you need, first of all, you need to set up an ideal. So basically, um, you're starting here with a truth that everyone should be able to identify with. Okay? So, so you know, for, in the case here, for example, about joy, you might be wanting to say, um, you know, it's interesting, isn't it, that when you look in the Bible, it's all full of Christians who are incredibly joyful. You know, here there's Paul in the, in the jail singing at night, and it's just, you know, even when there's huge things going on, there just seem to be people who are generally full of joy. So that's the ideal, yeah? Then secondly, you set up the reality, which is, but then when I look at my life, to be honest with you, I don't think I'm always full of that joy. And I was going, yeah, like me. And then you build, therefore, with people, the, there's the, the ideal, but then there's also the reality. And so at the end of that second point, where you're kind of saying, you know, to be honest with you, I'm not sure whether this is really... Um, this is this is that evident in me there's a huge obviously uh, hunger now everyone's on the edge of their seat going well how therefore do we solve it you know if the bible says this is should be the truth but our reality our shared reality is a little different to that you're therefore building in people a huge hunger of will tell me therefore how we can solve it and that's i think generally um a helpful little kind of framework to, to, to have in the back of your mind. So that at the end of your intro, you've built in people a kind of edge of the sea anticipation of what you're then going to bring. Rick Warren, who obviously leads a, a big church in America, he, uh, he puts it in a, in a similar way, but he actually starts, in his, he, he, he starts with his application in his introduction. And what he means by that is, if your application is basically saying, so what? Oh, cell leaders... Uh, why joy is important, oh mums of, of kids, why it's important. What he does is, which is really kind of similar to what I'm saying is, in his introduction, he in effect builds a hunger in people by saying, many of you here might be mums and just thinking, I just need more joy in my life. Or you might be, you know, in your work and you think, I know it's what I do it, but it's just a joyless place or whatever. And he starts in that sense with the application to build in people a hunger 
that they're identifying with what he's saying. Like more classic evangelical preaching tends to start with the application, well, that leaves the application to the end, as I've argued, and I think is the right way of doing it. But I think what I'm saying is if you pepper to a small degree your intro with general uh, points of practical application, you build in people an, an alertness that this is actually relevant for me. What Tom's about to say, I really need to hear. Does that make sense? And so you're saying to people, um, listen up, basically. Um, so I'll give an example here. Here's the ideal. Christian church should be full of joy. It's missionarily, missionally very important because the world should need to see a church full of joy. But then secondly, we, then we provide the tension. But then look at my own life and see how up and down I am. And so the tension people identify with. And therefore, thirdly, in this sermon, I'm going to be uh, <clears throat> dealing with how we become full of joy. And so therefore, to be honest with you, all of my sermons, if you look at them, start in a way that's built around that. And, um, and therefore the sermon is, a, is an answer to how we solve the, the, the problem that's been set up in the introduction. Uh, okay, and hopefully that means that people are, are hungry to hear it. Okay, does that make kind of rough sense? Good, okay. Eighthly, ask God for a structure as quickly as possible. Uh, means that you can then read commentaries with that in mind. Now, again, this is, I can't say this enough, this is just my personal way of working, so you might want to completely reject it, which is fine. For me, I, this is a way that I can prepare much quicker. If God has given me a rough structure, even if I then change it and tweak it, what that means is then when I pick up all my commentaries, rather than uh, what it means, so if I, for example, in this situation, I've got these three sub points. My main point is that Christians should be full of joy. How do we become that? Well, we first of all need to understand that sin drains joy, that uh, God is a joy giver, and that Christ's return, Christ return will signal joy eternal. If I've got that three-point structure in my mind, when I'm reading the commentaries, I can quickly read the truth that they, they're bringing and go, oh, that fits into um, point number two. That's or point number one. Sin is the real joy uh, drainer or whatever. And so actually, then I can just write point one next to it. And so then I can win pencil, of course, and then go through all these commentaries. And basically that means is in a very quick time, I've actually connected all the different truths and they nearly always will fit in some way with the overall structure that you've got. And that means then you can go back to it uh, knowing that you're trying to think, oh, how does this fit in again? But actually you've immediately connected it all, which just means that the process is much quicker. Does that make sense? Yeah, good. You're nodding. It's good. Okay, let's turn over. Okay, ninthly, I'm a visual learner. You need to know what type of learner you are. I think that's a really important point. I, I can't even remember all the different types, but the main ones I think are visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. I learning through doing, learning through listening, or learning through seeing. I think a lot of people are more visually learnery types than they realize. And when I realized that, that massively, massively uh, helped me in terms of um, both how I communicate, but also how I learn personally. So that is why, bow, 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 I have transitioned. <laughs> Can you zoom in on that? Yeah, yeah, don't worry about this. Now, this, is an, this, is a, uh, this is a slightly dilapidated because I've got a bit of water in my bag, but uh, <laughs> sermon notes, um, which I'll explain in a minute. And, it, and once I've unpacked, thank you. Once I've explained it, it might be helpful. Um, let me just quickly explain why I think... Um, why understanding this is important um freedom the freedom in preaching is really important okay so once you've worked hard at understanding the text once you've worked hard at the structure the freedom in the moment to actually proclaim it and not to be reading is so important people need to experience god as you're proclaiming it they need to actually experience the truth that you're telling them is right so you need to be so when you talk about sin draining joy they need to be experiencing conviction of sin when you're talking about christ's return they need to be sensing it in their souls you understand that so if you're trying to think well hey and you're not you're tied to your notes then that's going to massively in the moment in, uh, affect how uh, how effective you are actually bringing people into the experience um one of the main types of uh history of preaching types that has um that has come into uh that, that's existed in the last kind of hundred years is the evangelical rev revivalist form uh from whitfield to graham billy graham and this this kind of main type of preaching style obviously is has arisen in the last kind of a hundred years really or a couple of hundred years from whitfield was that in the 18th century i think um and and this type of preaching 
uh, style was different to previous styles in that, well, in fact, I've got a little list here, if I can find it, um, in that it actually, one of the reasons from a human point of view that Whitfield was so successful was because it was so dramatic was that actually there's a book which is very controversial called The D Divine Dramatist, which John Piper absolutely hates, uh, which I actually personally really enjoy. It basically looks at, from a human point of view, why was George Whitfield such an incredible communicator? Why could he preach to 50,000 people and hold them captivated? Um, and this, he kind of birthed uh, this whole sort of new genre of preaching, which is relevant to what I'm talking about, don't worry. Um, but this freedom in preaching, this ability to to proclaim the word of God in a way that people really experienced it. Uh, some of the shocking new sh preaching styles that Whitfield um, sort of pioneered were the following. First of all, shock number one was that Whitfield shouted. He was loud, so loud, his lungs were said to be made of galvanized iron, <laughs> speaking up to an audience of 100,000 people. 100,000 people without a microphone outside Glasgow. Secondly, he didn't use notes. He never read his sermon. There was no lectern, no manuscript, no turning of pages. Hallelujah. Thirdly, Whitfield was always in motion. Okay? He was just hugely active. Some of his best friends were some of the top actors of the day. And he learnt a lot of his craft from some brilliant world-class actors. So he was constantly in motion, strutted around all the time. Some estimated he walked a mile and a half in the course of one hour seven. Fourthly, Whitfield wept. Okay, this is totally radical stuff. No one preached like this. Whitfield wept. His emotions were in full play throughout. Second, uh, fifthly, rather, <laughs> Whitfield went for your emotional jugular. This was not a man out to tell you about the merits of one doctrine vis-a-vis -vis another in a calm, rational fashion. He made your heart palpitate, your palms sweat at the fierce judgment of God, and then balance that by raising your hands heavenward in thanks for God's grace. He made you feel the gospel. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Sixthly, Whitfield acted out the passage. Again, this was hugely controversial. He, would, he was hilarious. So he would literally... He would do women's voices and like, oh, no, you know, and kind of, it, you know, people, it was really shocking. And, and, and current preachers at that time thought he was outrageous, but he acted it all out. So it held people captive. He brought the story alive. Uh, seventhly, Whitfield never talked much about doctrine. The emphasis felt, was in, felt, felt, felt almost entirely on your feelings about what he was saying. He did preach doctrine all right, just to clarify, but he was a convinced Calvinist, yes, uh, and had a long spat with the uh, more Arminian Wesley, uh, Wesley brothers over the freedom of the will and predestination. But the focus of his sermon was not on the delineation of doctrine, but its appropriation, yeah? What, why it's important. So he got doctrine into people, but it wasn't, they weren't thinking, here's doctrine, ah, I will listen to the doctrine. It was this radical, glorious truth that I've got to hear it listen to. Um, okay, those are the main shocks then, and stylistically, of the revivalist form of preaching. So you might think, Tom, I don't want to ever be anything like that. I want to be like that. Personally, I think that just stirs my soul. And I think God's hard my, hardwired me a bit more like that than other preaching styles. Therefore, come back to my original point about how you learn. <laughs> it's really important because I used to spend, well, I don't know how long, but I would, each sermon was six to 7,000 words I typed. That was like my thesis or my doctorate was 7,000 words. Six, 7,000 words. So I had 18 to 19 sides of pages. Um, so the problem was that took a huge amount of energy and then um, me actually trying to uh, preach it was, was really hard because, it, you know, I mean, it's just like pages and pages, like a book, you know, trying to read through the book. Um, and so actually getting to anything remotely like a Whitfield freedom, I was like, well, maybe that's just not for me. Maybe I can never be like that. But actually, I have developed in the last 18 months, for me personally, a way of working that means now actually I can preach without notes. I have obviously my wacky, wacky notes in front of me, which I will look at a little bit, but generally far more freedom to actually proclaim and to live the word. So I'll do my best to try and explain um, how this has happened. Um, I'll tell you what I've actually got is I've got a whole load of these notes. Um, these are my actual sermons, so please don't sort of run off with them or anything. But if, I mean, you just can have a, you can take one and have a look at it if it's helpful, um, just so you've got a, a little representation. Some are neater than others. Some are actually quite neat, but most of them aren't. So basically, my goal was, can I get all of this on one bit of paper? Because if I'm a visual learner, if I can get it on one bit of paper, then I can take a photograph of it in my brain, or more or less, and... Therefore, um, 
I can actually, uh, rather than turning pages and trying to remember it, I can actually remember the form of it on the page, if that makes sense. So in the lead up to a sermon, obviously, I've mentioned to you about using the commentaries and everything, scribbling the commentaries. And then I'm just hoping there's nothing in there that I've written that's like wildly uh, <laughs> private. Um, so just look at the general form and then hand them back in. Um, but uh, uh, so when I'm preparing a sermon, I have lots and lots of plain bits of paper now, okay? <laughs> Which I'm constantly, so I've gone away from typing things um, to write scribbling down ideas. And once I've got the, um, once I've got the uh, structure in it, that God's given me a structure in it, I'm then writing things that refer to each structural point. Yeah, so I, I might be in the bath and an illustration comes in and I'll scribble it down afterwards, point, now that'll fit into point number three. So I'm constantly got this sort of stack of paper. And in a sense, all this is, uh, when I'm actually preaching, is if you can imagine almost behind it is all these other bits of paper that are, mi that are representing each point. So with each point, I've got it to the point of like it's one word or one or two words that trigger the memory of the original thing I wrote out in longhand. So the idea came to me in the weeks leading up to it, and I'll write down all these different ideas and then I'll work hard at saying, how can I remember that one idea in one word? And then that one word, or normally two or three words, makes it onto the master copy. Does that make sense? So and you'll be amazed at how if that idea that you've written out has actually gone into your brain, when you see that one word, actually you don't need any more than that because it triggers it. And therefore, that means that you can then get on one bit of paper more than enough information that represents a whole load of information that you've previously had. Does that make sense? So I think, therefore, that frees you from needing to write it all out in longhand, particularly if you have got a good, strong title and, and clear um, subpoints with good, uh, they're, they're, you know, they're phrased in a way that conveys your structure. It means it takes the emphasis on you needing to have a perfect sort of um, speech pre-prepared that can often feel a bit wooden anyway. So that's the kind of, that's, does that make sense? Anyone questions on that or does that convey? I mean, it's not that complicated. But then the color coding comes in because this, again, is, as a visual learner, um, is really helpful. So you've got about three different colors there. You've got your yellow, your blue, and your, your pink, and, so, and green, four. And for me, I've just, you know, I've just found, um, trying to identify on the mass of papers what um, each bit is about, uh, helpful in the color so so a green is basically if i've got a scripture on there that i want people to turn to so if it's like turn to verse four look at verse four i'll put in v4 and do a green so people so i know when i look at that that's going to require an action in the people um the yellow is just generally almost like the main truth that i'm going to be saying so it's going to be the main proclaimed the titles, it's going to be the things that I just want, that maybe a few crafted phrases in there. Sin is a real joy drainer. Come on, guys, tell me. And so it's just almost like clarifying. I want people to be remembering that phrase. And so that will be highlighted in yellow. Blue is anything that is either application or illustration. So if, you're, if, you're, if, you, if yellow is basically... Um, the main point and, and is you uh, explaining the, the scriptural truth, then the blue is the either the story or the application <laughs> about that truth that generally when I see blue, I feel relaxed because I think blue is, is either a story or it's an application and it becomes practical. Do you see what I'm saying? And I know, therefore, if I haven't got enough blue on there, I'm in trouble because blue means people will not just be thinking about the scriptural truth, they'll be thinking about Oh, that applies for me in my situation, or a story that uh, that applies it. And often, you know, as I said, when you're bringing stories, that brings heat, which brings, brings people awake, stirs their passions. So for me, I can quickly spot once I'm I'm putting it together where I'm weak. Uh, pink is, for some bizarre reason in my mind, help me to remember a, a, a negative thing or a challenging thing, something that you're going to have to slow down on. And you want the church to really hear. It's kind of, you don't want too much pink. Just one or two. I'm sorry, this is a bit painful, but I do think the church, we need to, th to hear this. Um, and that's all my four colours, isn't it? So, so therefore, therefore, I think... 
Orange? Is there an orange on there? Oh, I was probably just experimenting with orange. I've, I've, I've left orange. Okay, just one. I don't know. Um, does that kind of make sense? I'm sorry if this is a bit weird. I hope, I mean, it might not be helpful at all, but it therefore means that I can look at, my, at, at the thing and have all on one piece of paper the notes in a way that I don't have to be rifling around, but it's, it's all there and has a clear structure and I can remember, so I, because I visually remember things, I can literally remember like with the first point here, um, you know, this, is, this example is blessed of the poor in spirit. So what does it mean? Why is it important? And how can we get it? Um, you know, I've got, what does it mean? And the first, first little sub point under that is a, is, a, is a pink, which is like a negative, remember. It's not, it doesn't mean being poor in spirit is not a natural trait. Yeah, so I remember, oh yeah, like a, so first of all, it's still something that's not pink, then three blues, and then a nice big blue because of the funny story thing. So in my mind, I'm remembering it visually. Any questions, or does that make no sense at all? So you, um, you don't write it out in full beforehand, like, a, like you were saying, like a thesis and then condense, no. so you're purely kind of basing it on yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, basically what I'm doing before is I'm, if you've got a structure and you know roughly each, it, 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 it just takes the way, if you know you've got your one main point and your three points about that point, and you feel God's helped you to get to from the structure, the passage actually will lend itself to that structure. You're not putting the structure on the passage. Then all you're doing then is collecting ideas in the coming weeks that actually either are exegetical, applicatory, or illustrative of that point. And then you're just going, writing them down. So then when you, so it's actually more of an editing. The big thing I find whenever helping people with preaching is the editing. They've got good content and they're a gifted communicator, but it's how do I get this in a way that flows? How do I get this in a way that it's in me? How do I get this in a way that I actually believe it? And that people are, you know, that it's kind of in me rather than just this thing here. And how do I get so it's not dry? So I think um, this is all really about an editing process, I guess. It's a way of summarising it. But that way, I never actually write it all out in one big go now. No, it's all just pages and pages of ideas that then one word um, will trigger the, the memory and it's fitted into a structure that works. How, how much are you an internal or external processor and where yes. in the stage? So yeah. I can sit for a couple of hours thinking things through and I go all potty once I get up and walk around and basically talk to myself and yep. talk it out. Yes. That's when it comes together. Brilliant. What stage do you do that and how much do you? I, I'm an external processor like you as well. And I think so for me personally, um, I would really recommend trusting that you are probably more ready, as long as you've been doing what I've said in terms of thinking about it, meditating, scribbling ideas, often people will leave it right to the last minute to then actually produce something. Whereas personally, I try to do it earlier because I think there is, you can have something written that you think is the best thing in the world, but when you actually vocalize it, you realize it doesn't quite flow and it's actually very, very dry just it's you know it's just a bit boring often or it doesn't quite fit and it was too really heavy i often for some bizarre reason a lot of my first drafts are very serious very intense and everyone's wrong and sin is everywhere and you know so i just i don't know why um so unless i get to that so i think what i'd really say is trust that even if you think oh no i need to think more and before i write get it written down as quick as you can and almost just tell yourself i'm ready even if you're not and pretend talking it through and you'll feel like a wally uh, this is what I do. I'll just talk it through. I won't necessarily really preach it, but I'll talk through. And what I then find is that that stage, if you do that too near the actual time, you've got like no time to change it or very little. It's all pressured. But if you do that earlier on, you'll actually find you can then, oh, actually, you know, I can really change this and I've got time. And the external process of talking it through, particularly I think when you're beginning to learn to preach, for virtually everyone is really, really, really important. Um, I think probably even whether you're an internal or external, I think for most people, um, if you're not used to doing it um, or you're just you're, you're beginning in it, doing that earlier rather than later is really important. Even if you think, because one of the reasons is most people have too much material. So the longer you're just thinking about it, the more you then got to go back and chop tons and tons and tons and tons out. One of the things I say a bit later on, in fact, we can mention it now, point 13 is kill your darlings. I can't remember who said that. It sounds awful, doesn't it? I think it was, um, I think it was Martin Lloyd-Jones. Lloyd and he talked about, you'll have the story or the illustration that you just think, well, it just about fits. And it's just so good. Don't do it. He said, just chop it out. You, God will give you a chance at some point later where you will be able to do it you've got to make it if you listen if you read lloyd jones he's a brilliant person at this he actually 
if you read any of his um, commentaries, which are just kind of the transcript of his sermons, he, like many of the great preachers, would tend to do just one verse. And one thing that you think, oh, that's not really a whole sermon, is it? And blimey, he would make it a sermon like that you'd never forget because it was sharp. Yeah, yeah, he, he was so good at trusting that even one word, you know, there's one series, one, one famous um, sermon of his is just called But God. Or is it just but? Yeah, or but God. In Ephesians 2, where it talks about world being condemned and but God, rich in mercy. And I think that, um, that what am I talking about there? Oh, yeah, kill your darlings. So his, his whole thing is uh, chop out things. And this is what often preaching to someone else, they'll say to you, hmm, that kind of illustration is funny or it's good, but it doesn't really illustrate your point. It has to illustrate the point. Often people will get an illustration that doesn't actually illustrate the point. It illustrates the opposite. That's, that sounds a bit strange, but often you'll think, oh, that kind of illustrates it. And it kind of, well, it sort of does, but it's sort of almost the opposite. So you need to really work hard, like an arrow, making it sharp, making it almost like a, someone needs to be like, um, like an athlete with, you know, it doesn't need to be all baggy with lots of clothes on. It needs to be sharp so that it really, the thing about, again, with Piper's preaching, if you look at all his preaching, every sermon makes you want to, you look at the title, you think, oh, I want to look at that, I want to look at that. And the reason is because it's specific. It's because it's specific. He, he works hard with his titles and with his sermons and having the courage to make everyone specific rather than just prayer or something. So I was just looking this week at, and he, a whole sermon just saying something like, I can't remember the title, but something like the wonderful R in Our Father. So in the prayer, the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven. And the whole sermon is about corporate prayer, saying it's Our Father, it's not my Father. And I thought, blimey, I would probably haven't, I wouldn't have the courage to make one word my sermon. But I've remembered it already. I've thought because it's specific. So I think we've got to be, have the courage to kill our darlings, to kill things that make it sort of just a general nice talk and make it sharp. Because actually, particularly if you're preaching a lot, you do have the chance to then build up a whole layer of truth. Um, so just quick, yeah. Yeah, before you move off from your notes. <laughs> Obviously... Like you're getting more and more opportunities to preach elsewhere, as yep. well. and often you'll use a preach that you've done before. Yes. To change bits of it. Yep. Do you? Can you like say you did this preach six months ago? Yes. Can you look at it now and know exactly what it is, or do you have to go through the whole? Generally, process? but I think obviously the longer it goes back, the, the less. And I think that's why the video archive is incredibly important. So if it's, I will just have to listen to it back again, yeah. and maybe and look over and go, oh yeah, that's what I was talking about. So. Cool. Any other questions on the notes? Yeah, yeah. yeah. How closely do you actually stick to what you've written down here? It's a framework, but do you give yourself leeway when you're in it? Do you then just refer back to it sort of line by line? I tend to... I tell you, if I'm honest, I probably do stick to it quite a lot. I mean, but it doesn't fit. It feel, but there is lots of spontaneity in there, which which is what normally why I'm too long. Um, but uh, I think I do probably actually stick to it quite a lot. But it's 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 by this point, it's totally in me because it's just there, and I can remember it. It's all right in there. It's so the internalizing is massively important. Uh, point eleven. It means you actually live it. It means you're walking around, you know, talking about it, thinking about it. I think this is something that John really uh, epitomises. I've noticed the way you prepare, John. You, there's that <clears throat> that kind of that, there's that in you quality that you're. I can tell that you're living with it. You're meditating on it. It's it's of in you, and then almost for you, I think you get away with it, managing to put it down quite soon, you know, quite near to the thing, because I think you've been almost meditating on it and chewing on it internally. And I think that's really really important. I think you'll often find that you will be you will be applying it to your situations in the week it's bizarre isn't it how you'll you'll be suddenly you know in in a classroom or i'll be in you know in a, in a meeting or in a coffee house or something and um and suddenly be like, oh well actually and it's genuinely massively applicable if you find yourself doing that that's a really good sign that the sermon is you've got it so the amount of times i'll talk to someone and say okay before we start just tell me what your sermon's about and they'll go well, it's it's kind of uh, it's sort of, and actually, it hasn't they haven't actually worked to get into that real crystal. This is the this is what it's about, and therefore you'll struggle to apply it. My dad often, when I was starting to preach, he would often, in the down the phone, I'd be asking him a point. I'd go stop. What is your preach about, Tom? What's the actual main? What is it really going? And I'd be like, ah, and I hadn't quite worked through internally at getting into that point. And until you're at that point, you'll struggle to to be able to apply it in a way that you're really confident and clear on. Tom, yeah. How do you move from that place where, like earlier on, you were talking about like crafting language mm -hmm. and how important that is? Yes. How do you move from having to have like specific words which yes. are really crucial to yeah. then being 
really free if you're not kind of writing all that out? Uh, so, so the question again, so how... So like earlier on you were talking about the importance of having like language that's really specifically yes. crafted, you know, that you want to use particular wording yeah. because yeah. it makes it really clear <coughs> or because you want to really get a point home. So yeah. I guess that's often why people write things out because yes. though, you know, those are the words that make sense and yes. you want to be clear about mm -hmm. what you want to say. So how do you move from okay. having to yes. write it down because you're crafting the language yeah. Yeah. to where you're at. I right. just think, I think it's probably, I mean, for me, when I talk about crafting language, I'm really talking about the title right. and the sub points. Okay. And one or two, maybe. This is, again, this is just my personal thing. We're all different. I can't emphasize that enough. But so, so I, I think, think I therefore don't, and I'll train, I'll find often that that's the last thing I do. The structure I find God gives me quite quick, the general idea. So the illustration I mentioned about our four values as a church being gospel centered and widespread discipleship, it was only right like the day before that I felt that whole thing of gospel drenched and widespread discipleship. Um, so the general structure I feel God gives me quite quickly, and I would ask God, you know, ask, you should ask God for that as well. But I think um, the actual crafting of it is of the specific. Um, elements of the actual of the titles or the sub points I find is often only once you're really clear on what the Bible is saying and what God wants you to say in the moment. That makes sense. So it's almost the last thing in a way I find I, I end up doing. Why, sorry, the way I have done it when I've been well prepared, I'm just doing my preaching tomorrow. I've got to go do a lot of work. Is that I, will, I do quite a, quite a bit of summary for eighty percent of it. That's internalized. So I will I will do full notes, but then break it down. But those phrases I will write out word for word that I particularly want, so that they are there. Should I get overexcited or be a bit discouraged and tend to go yeah. off on a tangent? So those phrases are quite how you would do it when it's. Mm on one page is another thing, yeah. unless you have a separate one of the no. phrases. Yeah. But. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, is this also sort of stages on a journey? I and mean, as you said, it's when you're preaching, mm. you know, every other week on mm. average, yeah. you can get into that rhythm mm. and that flow. Yeah. For those of us who are preaching less frequently, yeah. I guess it's that balance between, maybe we all need more notes, if you like, in terms yeah. of a, a less until yes. we get to that point when we are preaching more frequently. And I guess it's, get, it's getting to that rhythm of preaching, isn't mm. it? I guess that's part of it. It's good. I think uh, what I was going to say, what Tim says next, is that, <laughs> <laughs> is that when you start preaching, you're often incredibly nervous and you worry far more about mm -hmm. filling time yes. and yeah. having enough to say. So yeah. you will write out you know, paragraphs like you would do an essay yeah. um, because actually you're worried about that person over there who's mm -hmm. looking at the fire exit when they're not looking at you. Yes. Um, whereas actually when you're confident, you will have your trigger phrase and you'll have your brown colour and your pink colour, like I would have, um, and, it, and, and you trust the moment. Um, and part of it is also the anointing of God on you as you're, as you're speaking, but part of it is also actually just basic confidence. Yes. Um, and so, you know, words unlock whole truths. So mm -hmm. I think it's what's helpful though, is whatever your opening phrases you want to unlock, is mm -hmm. have a word at the end that you want to come back and end on, yeah. so you don't get lost. That's great. Um, That's um, really but, helpful. But yeah, yeah, but I remember the, you remember the Sunday morning I lost my sermon <laughs> yeah. when Anna was on my shoulder and yeah. that was really helpful for me as a preacher yeah. um, because it moved me away from brilliant. needing brilliant. four sides of notes Absolutely. to actually, is it is it in you enough Absolutely. to come yeah. out Yes. Um, and That's to reduce great. it down to a side, or oh, I do two sides but we yeah. need to write it. It's a definite good thing. Sorry, that's a great illustration. Uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. That structure. So you have your three sub points normally, yeah. then you tend to have quite a lot of sub sub points. Yeah, I would do. you, and probably most people do that, do you have a limit on how many sub sub No, I think uh, there's not a kind of. Uh, um, I think. Like a, no, no, I, I think. Or, that's definitely a danger. So I think, um, yeah, I just think you hate that's, To me, that's one of the things that I find that I can only work out once I've actually run through it. This is the, this is the issue. issue. And then particularly when you're, as you John said, when you're starting out, you know, this is this massive deal I'm going to preach. So every, you can hit everything with it. I just opened the fridge and I realised that, you know, and so it just goes on and on and on. And that's why killing your darlings, killing the things you really want to bring in, but so that it's, it's actually, um, it's, it's, I think the, the danger, danger of sub 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 sub, 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 sub points is a very real one. So I suppose for you now, you often, because you're preaching regularly, 
you mm. have a shorter period to prepare things, so you mm. have less time living with it, although you're still really mm. living with it. Whereas probably for some of us, we've been preparing for like two months in yeah, advance. Yeah, definitely. And you could end up with 50. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah. Because everything felt speaking Definitely, definitely. A, a bit of a problem, so I'm a linear worker. So initially my thinking is one, one A, one A, one, one yeah, and I yeah. just go like that. And then when I come back to it, I have to cut out things that I draw attention to as a point. Because I want to, so I think in Ecclesiastes it says the preacher, yeah, 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 then firmly in the name, yeah. is that phrase in Ecclesiastes. So then I decide which points I want to highlight as points for yeah. people to hang the thought on that will then, so I often will make points but not call them points yeah. because mm. otherwise you're asking people to remember 20 yeah, points yeah, yeah. and that just gets confusing. But if yeah. you give them four and each one knocks onto one more and one more, yeah. so I think it's just quite how. What you draw attention to as a yeah. point, remember this above yeah. other things. Yeah, yeah good. Great. Can't swear of time. Sorry. So <laughs> hopefully it's helpful, guys. Um, okay. Uh, to point twelve. Internalizing means you are you are not to. Sorry, my typing. Uh, oh yeah, you, you're not trying to remember it. That's a key thing. Um, so you're trying to get to the point where it really is internal. It's not that you're trying to remember things, as that you really believe it. You know, and that's the point. Is that there's a really weird moment you suddenly get, you think, I really believe this about joy, and I want to tell you, you know, and it's so relevant to you, Tim Wilson, or to you, Jeff Mell, and you just, there's that glorious moment where it's like this scary preach, and I just, what am I going to say? And then you're trying to remember it all, and then suddenly you go, no, wait a minute, this is the most important message the world's ever going to hear. And that's what, to be honest with you, good preaching about, it makes everything massively arresting so you know lloyd jones again he's almost humorous in like the start of every chapter is like there is perhaps no greater truth than we're about to look at today you know everything's like oh, what's he going to talk about you know um it's it's brilliant it's dramatic and it's and it's it's so exciting so you need to get it in you uh it's uh, got a great preacher called sankster um in his book preaching he just got six titles six chapters and one of them just says believe it and i just love that you've got to really believe it which just sounds so obvious but People can smell it if you're just worried about, you know, and of course there's a journey. So when you're beginning, you will be worried and that's fine. You're in a family, so people are with you. But the more that you can get it internally is really important. Okay. Uh, 40, make your points the positive version of the negative. I often, I found I my points would tend to be like, I don't know why, but for some reason would be quite negative. They'd be kind of like challenging, but in a kind of negative way and i actually again talking to my dad on the phone often about structure he'd say well you could say that or you can actually say it in the positive version can't give any illustrations at the moment but i'm sure you can um and actually then bring in the, the negative as a part of the overall encouragement i think one of the things i've realized is often you don't need particularly in our church where people i think are really good people who really are going for it and and they and they've generally grace grace-filled spirit-filled people who love god we don't need to be heavy and i think i've learned that you want to be clear and firm but in our context i've noticed that times where i've probably overdone the kind of and another thing have just not borne fruit they've borne condemnation mm -hmm. and so i think actually knowing your flock is really important so i would almost say generally i think god's grace this church with a lot of people who really are sincerely trying to walk with god and so when you bring a challenge it doesn't have to be really heavy we'll say it a couple of times and they'll get it and they'll really take it you know people have got good consciences which take it seriously therefore you're if you're if you're if your titles are kind of all really challenging and kind of negative and a bit mm, you're in trouble then you're you know everything just feels awfully negative um Use words that are accessible, not impressive. Again, this is David Pawson point. He talks about the difference between Saxon-based words and Latin, uh, which basically I think he means is like uh, there's a you know English kind of words derived from both these, and some and it can be tempting to use words that are somewhat impressive, and um, are often more Latin in in origin, whereas actually um, I think he would strongly say. You know, one of the brilliances of C.S. Lewis, for example, was he was, you know, a triple first from Oxford, one of the brightest men to ever live. The reason he changed the world in many ways through his writing was because he had the courage. And he said, and you don't understand an idea until you can express it simply. And I think therefore having the courage to use simple words that don't have to be boring, but simple words that everyone can understand, which are apparently often more Saxon based, according to David Pawson, um, rather than impressive words. And within that, the only thing I'd throw in is we do have to biblically um, 
what's the word you know teach our church our church mustn't be, mustn't be biblically illiterate and this isn't an appeal to make everything like you know cbb's this is like saying you know you have to explain propitiation because it's in the bible and redemption and they need to know long words because long words are god's chosen way of communicating a very profound practical truth that we need to so there's a blend there but i'm just saying that we we, we mustn't try and uh, be too clever in that sense Pray into the church. So again, this is the whole thing of uh, once you've got, you've started to actually go through it. Um, really important phrase. Uh, this is massively important. Spurgeon talks a lot about this. He says often when his sermons either were great or not, I can't think of any sermons which weren't not good, but um, in his view was the difference between how much he prayed. And I'd really challenge on you that I'm talking praying, pr- crying out to God. That tests your heart. If at the moment that you think, yeah, I want to do that, and I do do that, then it shows your heart's good. If that's alien to you, the idea of it, you're probably more still thinking about you getting through it rather than the point of it, which is to serve the flock. So I think a praying preacher is absolutely essential. Seventhly, preach it to others who are preachers, not just friends. Because they'll go, mm, nice. Preachers who understand the craft of preaching. Find them. This room's full of them. Please, please, please do that. Um, I still try to do that a guy called mark devere who is or deva how you pronounce it who leads a massive church right next to the white house a baptist uh, it's capitol hill baptist church he's uh, famous for so this church is massive you know he's one of the most influential christians leaders in america and he will very famously on the night uh, on a sunday night he'll gather his kind of equivalent to impactors or young people and say come on critique my sermon what was rubbish about it and he that's his absolute priority is getting feedback from from often people who you'd never think would get a chance to to speak into his life uh because he's so keen to be um to be getting better and so i'd say make sure you preach it to others beforehand but also uh we'll t- i'll touch upon it later also afterwards in terms of um assessing it what what when you preach to someone else what happens is you you realize what's rubbish you realize um if it's too heavy and there's not enough uh, illustration you realize if you don't really believe it because you're going and that is why we must all be people who are full of joy you know and you're like you don't really believe it do you you know um and i think when you proclaim it to someone there's no you know one person is the hardest person to preach it to so if you can do it to them you can do it to a church it also will show you where the anointing lies and what i mean by that is there is particular parts of a sermon often god will just underline and it's only when it's often the bit you're not expecting You'll often go, oh, this is good. I'm going to really nail this bit. And then you, t- you talk it through and they go, stop, 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 stop. That bit was amazing. I remember years ago doing a sermon and we actually had Andrew Wilson, day, uh, Wilson down and I ended up doing a bit of the sermon. It was a, a time like this. And I did some of it to, to the guys. Some of you are here. And there was a throwaway line in it. I said, it's a bit like the horizontal, horizontal relationship we have with each other and the vertical relationship with God. And... Um, and then afterwards, you're like, I have never heard anyone express that truth or whatever in those terms. It's so obvious, the vertical and the horizontal. Now, if you know, you know, my preaching, that kind of comes in all the time. And it's not to please Andrew Wilson. It's because he was right. And actually, that feedback gave me a confidence, as you were saying, John, a confidence in something that I was, I had so many notes. I was all like, oh, I've got to just pack it full. I was like, and then when I, when I said it, I was already... Because I knew if Andrew, you know, is a likelihood everyone will have a a response like that. So when I was like, I slowed right down and I really made it a big main point, which stayed in people's minds. And that only became, uh, that only came about because of preaching to someone beforehand. The other side of the coin is you'll learn where the pastorally sensitive bits are that you wouldn't have spotted. Yeah, you'll throw a throwaway line that you think everyone will understand that. You say to someone, they go, do you realize that when you're saying that, you know, I'm from a, I'm from this type of background and actually what you said really struck a chord, to be honest with you, and it's a little insensitive and you're, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. And that protects you <clears throat> if you can preach it to someone else beforehand and uh, help you to, um, therefore, point 18, listen to the spirit for the right tone. Um, so, for example, when I preached on the fear of God, one of the things that I just in the moment beforehand, this wasn't preaching to someone else, but I felt God say to the tone you preach, this is almost more important now than the content. And I think I preached it in a much more of a kind of gentle, quiet, slower paced thing than probably I would have naturally done. Um, and often when you preach to someone else, that will become clearer um, as you do that. 
make sure you try and consistently build tension and release throughout the preach. So again, a bit like I explained at the beginning, um, the whole ideal, then the reality, and then the solution. I think most sermons need to have that kind of flow between them. Most, you know, script writers will tell you that good scripts have, have that in them. And I think, again, um, is that, for example, a good illustration, for example, is the, is the current series we've done on the Beatitudes. What does it mean? So the three questions I've asked, if you notice, build tension, what does it mean what be at so poor in spirit what does it mean why is it important and how can we get so if you answer the first one so the first tension is i don't understand what that weird mean phrase means P poor in spirit what does it mean so you answer what does it mean and therefore you release the tension oh i get it now but then you say but why is it important and then you start to explain why it's important and by the end of that point you're thinking you're right, this is the most important thing in the world. I'm not poor in spirit. You've just described it to me. And actually, I've understood it now, and now I've seen what's important. Oh my goodness. And you're all healthily tense again. So then your third point is, is how do we get how do we grow in it? And by that point, everyone's like, Yeah, I need to know. Because you've taught you you've taken me on the journey and I now need to know it. And so you've gripped people the whole time. Does that make sense? So that I think again, I know it sounds all terribly complicated, but um just God will help you to grow in that, I'm sure, that you're trying to build tension and release all the way through. And the great, glorious moment that every sermon should have as the ultimate pressure, tension, tension reliever is the gospel. <clears throat> so uh, let's just touch upon here, point 19, the difference between indicatives and imperatives. Again, what am I talking about there? Basically, um, the Resurgence website has done a little blog on this entry if you want to look at it in more detail. This is uh, this keeps cropping up actually at the moment in certain situations I'm in. Um, an indicative, as far as I'm aware, basically is a truth that it is true about the situation. So in our case, um, who? So let's take the example. Indicatives are the the gospel um, tell gives us indicatives about who we are. It shows us who we are now in Christ. Yeah, indicative is about telling us what has been done. In this, in this context, the imperatives are talking about what we now do in light of that. So I've heard one guy recently say, <clears throat> the diff he, he talked to a good preacher, but talking about we mustn't ever, in a sense, tell people what to do because that just leads to legalism and um, it's not kind of biblical. We've just got to proclaim the gospel of what Christ has done, which is the indicative, yeah? In this situation, it's about... Uh, Understanding that we're all legalists at heart, we're all biased towards trying to do stuff. Therefore, when I talk say about indicatives here, it's talking about emphasizing the finished work of Christ, which of course is absolutely central and the starting place. He, I believe, I was overemphasizing this because he the, the Bible is also full of imperatives, i.e., commands. In light of that, now live holy. In light of that, love one another. In light of that, forgive one another. In light of that, don't commit sexual adultery, etc. Does that make sense? The Bible's actually both. And there is a real kind of current potential overemphasis, if I might put it, this sounds bizarre, on the gospel. In the sense of clumsily saying the gospel is just all about what Christ has done, which it is. But in light of that, the whole load of imperatives come out of that. You look at most of the, of the letters, they are written, they start off with the indicative. What Christ has done, who you were, now who you are. You've done nothing to do with this and feel the pressure release. Hallelujah. But now go out and make sure you live a, a life that's generous and gospel centered. So uh, know what you can. I know. I think most of us tend towards imperatives, doing stuff, practical stuff. How do we, you know, don't talk about all this, you know, what Christ has done. Tell me, how do I do? How do I live? So I think we deliberately try and nowadays really bring the gospel in because when you're, if you're feeling, I want to be full of joy, tell me, how do I do that? And ultimately the answer to everything is understand the gospel. <laughs> it is. But then that leads to a transformed life in behavior. Does that make sense? So that's, a, that's a little bit of a note about the difference to, in those two. Uh, okay, just got to speed up. Try and use humor to open people up and then hit them. Um, we're all, you know, some of us, uh, you know, are more prone to humor than others. Um, and that's fine, we're all different. But I would say that most of us can be funny. And uh, the gospel ultimately is a serious thing. We have to say, we have to realize that this is, this is life and death. This isn't a joke. This isn't stand up comedian time. But I would say that there is humor in the Bible. And that actually, uh, particularly as we bring more and more non-Christians in, showing that we do have a sense of humor is hugely helpful in unlocking them. Uh, and then, frankly, hitting them. Um, CJ Mahaney is one of the best in the world at this. You will just be crying with laughter and then he'll go, 
but and you're like oh you know absolutely fantastic so i would really um again look to bring that in i've already mentioned 20 point 21 point, uh, point 21 they need to experience god and the point you're telling them as well as learn about it that's the whole point about the whole thing of whitfield and the proclaiming it which is why we need to be free in our preaching if you're all tied to your notes you won't be able to do it final tips and then we'll finish um illustrations i i use i i tend to uh, i would really say make sure they're self-deprecating make you look like a bit of a wally um i think if you use illustrations which show how great you are people just won't really like you or identify with you particularly if you're young but even if you're old i think you know i mean i'm not saying a false kind of oh i'm so such a complete mess that's not helpful either but you know what i'm saying just making sure that they're humble and often about your own struggle i think the more that you can help people to show your struggle, but then the victory, the more you'll win people. Uh, be, be aware of pace. Know your natural weakness. For me, I tend to talk too fast. Therefore, imitate others <coughs> who are better at being slow. Again, Mike Betts is an illustration. Um, because he's confident, well, it, it's, it's his natural temperament to be like that anyway, but because he's, he's confident in his content, he goes at a slower pace and i try to emulate that because i think i'll end up really going for it at different times but if i at least start at a good pace for others it may be that you're a little too slow and actually bringing a bit of energy and pace in is what you need to think about beware of the environment practically temperature makes a huge difference it really is important so i'd say particularly um to keep the pace up particularly if it's either cold or hot so um, the hall we're in now is pretty good, actually. But I think I've preached in places where it's absolutely boiling and it's just really hard. And I'd say you have to work harder. Use more probably kinesthetic learning, interaction, walk around a bit. Keep people like, oh, why is he walking around? Just do stuff that you find natural to help people keep awake and use those, particularly when the environmental constraints are more against uh, the preaching of the word. Be aware of movement. Again, I tend to pace a lot. I hate that in myself, personally, because I think it just is like, it's like watching a tennis match. So I've worked really hard to try and stay still. You would be impressed, guys. I've been here the whole time um, because I think it actually it helps people to rest into the listening. Again, that's just for me personally. Um, use interaction and questions. Uh, that's something I, I, I wouldn't you know, always do that, but it's helpful. Visual aids are also important. Role play even. Um, again, obviously a few weeks ago, I used the whole summarizing the Beatitudes thing with all those different things. That's just a winner. People immediately are connecting. They can remember it. I bet you most of us can have got a bit more of a memory of it than we would have had. Very, very simple. And um, people, keeps people awake. Um, and then finally, after we've preached, uh, just a few things, lower expectations of feedback. I have to say, we live in an amazing church, so I'm blown away by that amount of feedback, texts, emails, everything. So I, I hope that continues as a church culture um, because actually, point two, we need it, actually. And I don't think that's, un I don't think it's an um, egotistical thing. I think it's a reality. We're in a spiritual battle. And if the enemy can get preachers and teachers to think they've failed or they're rubbish and to try and shipwreck their ministry, History, he's won so i think that whole point a worker deserves his wages you know obviously that's talking about money but I th especially one who teaches and, and labors in that i think a part of my wage though is hearing you guys say that point changed my life when i hear about it actually changing lives i think oh it was work worth all the the sleepless nights or the you know they're working in it so i think the more we build that as an expectation it's part of the wages, I think, that a worker deserves. Uh, a lunch post-preach, I know it sounds silly, but I, we tend to have no one back on a Sunday if I've preached. Because I just if you've really poured your heart out, no matter how much positive feedback, you tend to just have an Elijah moment, or I do anyway, where you, you know, you're just feeling a bit like <sighs> exhausted, feeling like you've been a bit rubbish. And it's all irrational. And nothing that a good sleep won't cure uh, most of the time. But therefore, if you've got lots of people who are in the meeting with you and they don't talk for an hour about how amazing you were, you end up thinking, oh, I've totally failed because they just said it was good. Thanks. You know, so just being honest, I would say even how we structure our our week, we tend to try and work around my pathetic insecurities. Um, <laughs> walk and pray. Like, you, 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 sound... you made it sound like you do get lots of texts. And yeah, no, I said that. Yeah, yeah. But I think Sunday afternoon, I think, you know, 
are quite a hard time in our family. And I think, you know, you do get texts, but you often get them on Mondays mm. or, and so I think, you know, even when you preach really regularly, mm. that feeling of nakedness and vulnerability yeah. after you preach, and if people don't talk to you about it after, mm. This isn't a hint for everyone to say. <laughs> <laughs> I just mean, I don't want people to think that you get those texts and other people don't. <laughs> you, know, you often do, and you have to keep it so faithful in that. Like Sarah Davis is the most amazing, just yeah. so good at commenting and all that, so amazing. Yeah. But we're not, you know, I think that's something you just have to live with because people yeah. have busy lives. And yes. I don't always text people to say that. No, 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 absolutely. So I think we've got to be, that's why I'm saying first point, low expectations of feedback. Because I th And I think a lot of this is to do with actually, I'm there to please God, not to please man. And I'll just say the last 18 months, my preaching, I feel has really changed. Uh, and I've said this before, I think I, uh, I like making people laugh because I get feedback immediately. And I've, when we started doing the Death by Love series and we started doing the Gospel, the Atonement, it isn't funny. It is really heavy. And it's the Gospel. And I realised I, this idol in me was being threatened, which was approval. And God has just knocked it on the head. Well, he's, he's ongoingly doing that. I have to keep fighting. And so the ultimate point of this is finding your pleasure in, in the Father. You know, but also not being super spiritual that we are a family and just as Daisy or Lily, if they did something, I'd lavish. And I think generally we're in a very good church with that. But I just say if we in this room, 20 of us just sort of mentally go, yeah, I'll just encourage the guys who are preaching that will continue to really protect those who are, who are, who are teaching. I mean, just as an, as an aside, Jackie, the amount of times that Daisy has said stuff. And and she's quoted just off the top of my head. Jackie, you know, in our in our TGR meeting, was saying about Jesus and boats or something. You know, I can't remember what she said, but you know, and I and I and I've never said to you, I don't think, apart from now, how amazing that is that you're helping us raise our kids. So praise God. Um, choose not to bring your mood into the marriage. Uh, I'll do my best on this one. Um, enough said. Um, <laughs> planning fun stuff. Josie's like, what? <laughs> planning fun stuff. After time. Um, uh, with people generally relaxed with. And then I've said here, finally, what's your sermon? Uh, the Mark Dever uh, one I've mentioned. This guy, you know, the, the guy from Washington. Um, because I think that's really important. Um, going away from kind of afterwards, one thing that you haven't um, kind of covered is um, finishing a sermon. So you, okay. some yep. people find it hard to start and yep, yep. where do you start and stuff. But I sometimes find that I can get my points and everything mm, together. Mm. And then it's like... How how on earth do I bring this down to a, a landing point? Yes. Um, what do I need to include, and um, mm. how do I, you know, finish yes. well? Do I just sit down, or yep. do I get people to stand up and pray for them, or you know, all those kind of decisions? Yes. Is it going to be a ministry time, or are yep. we going to um, have a gospel call, and all those kind of things? So maybe could you just? I'm I'm talking, talking I'm obviously chipping guys as well but I think I, my, I think it depends on every sermon so I think again being part of a team I don't think we're ever designed to do this on our own I think we're designed to be with people say what do you think and I'll often ask Tim and Hugh what guys do you think about you know and I think if it's going to be a sermon with lots of light in it lots of just truth you need to think about you're probably not going to necessarily go for a big massive emotional response at the end with everyone you know if you've got more of a okay the like idols something about idols or you if you emotionally have been very stirred by it yourself i find that's a helpful rule of thumb and again if you're an elder and you know the flock you have that unique position of being to understand this is going to really touch people today in a way that you probably won't do if you're not pastoring the church but nevertheless i think you can kind of get that sense i think the more you do it if i've been stirred deeply about this it's probably likely that others will be too and therefore d d deciding on what type of response to go for will flow out of that um, i think personally in terms of actual landing of the sermon again it will really vary i personally I think some would tend to almost go, so today, you know, I know one one thing about one sort of a type of, of, of um, teaching is the whole thing of tell people what you're going to say, then tell them it and then remind them. I By the end of it, I personally, although I've tried different ways of doing it, I tend to try and go for one big fat story um, just because the way I'm made and the way I think, it, particularly if the sermon has got some sort of response element, which I think normally they do have something often it's the third point you know something and, and often try and often the third points do seem to be slightly bigger bigger picture stuff like christ's return will signal the beginning of the joy on everlasting uh you know i'd look for an illustration a story um about i mean there was an illustration a woman called jody erickson tada 
who got paralyzed from the neck downwards and yet she's had this extraordinary you know ministry and, and she, there's a bit where she talks about her life it's going to be where she can have a new body and joy and everything so i'd almost probably try and finish on something you know something high and then yeah, at that, that moment call people to, to, to stand. stand but if that's if it's more of been a heat type of sermon it's your responsibility to think through how you need to end. Mm, yes. You've almost got to give them permission. Because they will be feeling something yes. as you yeah, are preaching. Definitely. That way, which you might not be no. aware of yeah. until you both have had that chat. Yes. Great. Before. That's really good. That's, that's a very good point. Okay, well, that wasn't quite half an hour. Uh, <laughs> an hour and a half. But I think it's been really helpful. Mm. Any other questions at all? I don't think. Uh, Ollie? Just had a really quick one. Um, so, um, <coughs> people like Martin Lloyd Jones, when he's asked what's your main aim of when you're preaching, he says it's for people to experience um, God. Yeah. Um, and so, w would you say that that would be your main aim? And then also, how would you bring that in when, for example, a few weeks ago you talked to UCA, predominantly to non Christians, mm. about God loves sex. So, what's the deal with <laughs> sex and what's the deal with God? And I know for a few of us um, here today, like we'd be speaking regularly to lots yes. of non Christians about yeah. Jesus. So, like, what should uh, how, how do you kind of what's my question um, how do you get from your main aim being for people to experience God in the church context and how would this kind of stuff differ just in a, in a very short way to when you're preparing a preach for many non-Christians I would personally say um, an evangelist can probably give a better answer so I think I'm called to do the work I'm a pastor that is what I am so I'm called to do the work of an evangelist so I do my best I for, so from a church setting Tim Keller talks about he thinks normal preaching should be about 80 20 80 percent of what you're saying is aimed at Christians 20 percent is aimed overtly at non-Christians on a Sunday so so you're even when you're preaching to the Christians, you're doing it with non-Christians in mind so they can understand it. But then there are those moments throughout it which constitute overall about 20 percent where you're really saying and you may well not take a Christian viewpoint. So I think really the answer to that is almost however you would on an, if you're preparing for a Sunday, prepare if you were to take the 80 20 thing, however you would mentally approach that 20 percent is obviously just extend it to kind of 100%. And I think, uh, you know, other guys who do more of it might have other stuff to add, to be honest with you, who you are. I mean, I I find it a real challenge because I love to get very excited and to, I don't know, do you know what I'm saying? I, I think if I'm kind of full on, as I would be on a Sunday with a non-Christian, it's too much, I think, normally. It's just like, whoa, you know, um, so I don't know if I'm the best person to answer that, but I think um, anyone here who might, might be more of an evangelist that might be able to answer that more, apart from the obvious things of like assuming nothing. I mean, I try to almost assume nothing anyway um, on a Sunday because you've constantly got non-Christians there. So you know where books are in the Bible, what words mean, slowing right down. Things like if you're going to use one metaphor for the kingdom or for the go or for the gospel don't switch around if you're going to talk about you know propitiation and the wrath of god talk about that don't mix it with then too much like kingdom ideas or or covenantal stuff or you know being washed clean or you know i try and keep it as razor sharp as you can so if you're talking about jesus with his with the way he communicated with the non-christians was very simple wasn't it and he didn't try to ex he didn't he wasn't a systematic theologian if i might put it that way he he allowed there to be mystery. And I think he used stories, particularly stories, to connect with people. One of the things I was going to talk about was the use of stories, but just uh, obviously I haven't got time. But I think using narrative is really key and trusting that if Jesus, when he was asked about the kingdom, said, oh, it's a bit like a field. Think, what? Come on, Jesus, this is life and death. You know, get a bit more, you know, we don't have feet. You know, well, you sell your thing, you buy the field and it's in there. And he was, he was obviously relaxed about trusting the spirit, kind of uses what we might think is a very inadequate presentation of what the gospel is to actually bring it alive in someone so so um that's really helpful and um, so when when you're preparing um, yeah like an evangelist that taught, like you would do at a lunch bar would you use the same kind of um would you use the same kind of system to prepare with like the one sheet uh, but would you kind of involve more use sort of kind of stories um, to keep it really simple and explain everything if, yeah, if the context is I'm on their patch, yeah. I think it's only fair to do that. So if I've come in 
And it's kind of like there. It's almost like the whole thing of spiritual milk versus meat. I think I will really, really keep simplify it and almost challenge. My challenge will be one challenge and it will be small and it will be like a, because I don't feel like giving me permission to, to ram it down the throat. If they're on a Sunday, uh, it's very different in the sense that I will be much more like if they've got this far, I'm not going to patronize them with like a kind, you know, I'll talk a lot. I'll, I'll mention hell and judgment, uh, you know, regularly so that they, that, that everyone, whether you're a non-Christian or not, is living in the full doctrine. Paul talks, and I he said, I did not shrink back from proclaiming the whole doctrine of, of God to you. I think that's important, in the, you know, in, in our kind of culture, which is a little bit, you know, British. <coughs> Yeah, I'm kind of being evangelist, but I haven't quite worked hard at that aspect, particularly with vision, where hopefully there's a lot of non Christian students coming. I think the starting point is some tiny little attention. attention. There are very few contexts where you're going to be speaking to non Christians where they haven't been aware and opted in to that situation. N nearly every context, even if they've not opted in to be told about the gospel as such, they know they're coming to a or they're coming to a carol service or they're coming to a CU talk. They know there's going to be a Christian looking, and the starting point is not necessarily for the tension of a Christian truth, but is I I find this helpful. There are always questions in everybody. There's the, our hearts are searching after God, and it's trying to identify those questions, the tensions in them are ready mm. to then build. So obviously, sex mm. is the classic one. People want to know about sex, and immediately that's a hook, as it were, mm. to hang on, and that's the routine. So Paul went and said, "Hey, you guys serve this unknown God." He, he got a hook that they already had. They were already looking and already involved. They said, this is who he is. And they're saying, you've got the searching, you've got this long one. Well, this is the... So I guess... Well, that's very good. I think, I think uh, and uh, just something else I'll throw into that with, I think um, Tim Keller's work on, um, I can't remember the phrase, but it's almost like defeater beliefs. So understanding what your cultural defeater beliefs are, the things that people believe defeat the gospel. What about suffering? What about this? Understanding roughly what the main ones are in your in your cultural context enables you to actually help you combat them and show how the gospel does a, a very key one i would just throw in for us i think is he talks a lot about in his context in new york where you've got a lot of older brothers so in terms of the prodigal son a lot of the emphasis on the young wild one that we all kind of often think well <laughs> not really like him the, and he, his massive emphasis on the older brother who did well who achieved well who was his issue wasn't license but legalism his issue was self-righteousness and the idol of that i think has been the key thing for him and unlocking a whole city really and i have to say i think canterbury is not that dissimilar there's a lot of people in canterbury who are quite high achievers who are quite morally aware who are quite kind of, you know, I'm at uni, I've done pretty well, and I've come from a nice background, and yeah. And almost therefore understanding what, what, what was the challenge with the older brother? What was going to cause him to not understand the gospel? For him, it wasn't so much, it was actually, to, it wasn't like I need to be forgiven. For him, it was I need to understand I'm a sinner. I actually need to first of all understand. So for, for therefore, if we understand that our kind of city context is a lot of older brothers who are quite high achievers and are quite nice, and will think, I'm not really sinful. That's why much of my preaching is about attitude of sin. I'm always talking about that, aren't I? Because I think most people don't see themselves as sinful. They see themselves like the older brother. And therefore, the gospel has no power because they don't need to be saved. So I think, I think picking up from what Hugh's saying, understanding what the thing that's going to stop them feeling that tension you've got to get to. Yeah. I'd, I think I'd add as well, like when you're preaching to non-Christians, predominantly is taking this structure but and thinking through what if you were preaching to the church you would be thinking what's my main point what am I trying to get them to believe or think or or do and it's the same in a non-christian structure but you're thinking a bit differently so you're thinking you know am I wanting them to be challenged on their view of sex or do I want them that by the end of it to completely change their view of sex or do I w want them to change their view on God because of that or and so on. So, and I think um, Adrian Holloway's kind of illustration of the stages of, of growing towards a Christian is really helpful in that sense because you're you're then able to think, well, I don't. Every time you preach the gospel to a non-Christian, although you want to have faith to see people saved, you don't always have to have everything and everything laid out. You can be bringing people on a journey with you, mm -hmm. um, which I think is really helpful. <coughs> and it's very different to preaching the gospel. I think 
on Sunday than it is in a lunch bar or in a university, um, where you may only just be wanting to tease things and helping things along. Any other questions before we finish? Yes, Kev. Um, just um, you talked about kind of you know making assumptions or not making assumptions mm. about the, uh, the the listeners. Um, mm. How how would you? This is something I struggle with. How do you know where to draw the line in terms of kind of how much backtracking you do in terms of um, like for example, you're preaching about maybe you're preaching about the Holy Spirit mm. and you're preaching about um, mm. um, like the promise promise God made about the Holy Spirit and maybe the benefits of, of that yeah. but then how far would you go back in, in terms of maybe talking about the fact that kind of God you know God always desiring to have um, have, a, have a dwelling place with us and all of that yeah, kind of yeah. stuff or well, where do you kind of say no we can't kind of we can't do all of that this mm. morning and we need to kind of make some assumptions that people maybe already know that mm. I think it has to be an intuitive spirit led case by case thing that probably the more you do it the more you'll just sense some things are worthy of a two or three minute backtrack and some things aren't and 95 percent of people will get it i think that's why personally i think some uh, this is almost it comes back to the question of who you're preaching for some churches would really preach really overtly as if almost really solely to, for the non-christian the problem with that is you end up basically just bringing milk the whole time and actually the rest of the church doesn't get fed so i think if your assumption is i'm preaching sort of 80 percent as it were and i'm preaching mainly to build the church up to strengthen them in the hope that they will then in spiritual maturity continue to bring people in the people coming in as long as you're they will they will understand that it's a bit weird i think you can't make everything understandable almost you can't you know there is mystery and there is that trusting that just as when you came in for the first time you'd be like what's this about you know that the spirit will explain things to people and it's amazing how often you talk to non-christian afterwards and they have actually understood and felt comfortable with far more than you would have realized so i think it's a bit of an annoying answer but i think it has to be a bit of a trial and error thing and 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 at certain times you will feel god sort of saying i think you really need to help them to understand this um, and, and it's worthy of opening your Bible, going back to, you know, the promise of it and going through other times. So there's no there's no kind of I think it's just a kind of practice thing. I think, too, Tom, that in the context of a sermon, you're preaching a particular sermon. Yeah. Uh, maybe your aim is to see people in this better uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh, you need to unpack the things which mm. are essential mm. to your purpose yes. and leave the rest. Very good. So yes. your backtracking is only going to be mm. to clarify the things which you're going to need for mm. your purpose, Great. which is to see people baptised in the Holy Spirit. Mm. Uh, you don't actually in that situation mm. need to unpack the whole doctrine of the Trinity, for no. example. Yeah. So you That's need great. to pick on the things which are important to what you're doing. That's great. Good summary. Great. I have a very quick, quick stylistic question. Yeah. Yeah. Some, Some people, people often say that, that it's good, good to, to kind of say things more than once, like to yeah. kind of repeat as you go. What you I think, again, this is probably again a, a preferency thing some people who are very quick will find it annoying my and there's a whole style of this is kind of is i like i feel uh, you know jesus came to earth and he used illustrations and everything that were very simple so because i think his heart was for people to understand so my personal conviction is that repetition is a good thing because i think i i'm often thinking i want x who perhaps is illiterate or or who you know um is who's never gone to university or whatever yes i want uh, i want everyone and i want the church to know that's my heart so i think in terms of repetition i would therefore want um not over the top but certain repetition particularly i would say of if you've got say three sub points um to feel fairly free to do that but at the same time i think people have got different views times where i've done it quite a lot someone said it's a little bit annoying Another time someone said it helps me a lot. I mean, I think Martin Lloyd Jones again said that repetition is the key to teaching. So I think if you I think you can repeat an idea 
but from a different angle. Right. So it's not literally saying the same phrase over and over again. But sometimes that really works. I remember when Kevin and I worked on your, your preaching in the summer, and I can't remember what it was. There was a little phrase that we just stumbled across, wasn't it? And it was beautiful. And you just and then when you did it, you're just throwing it in really gently. It wasn't like a kind of mantra. It was just kind of... And I remember talking to one guy afterwards who was really affected by it. He used that phrase. So I think, again, there is this kind of spirit-led element that I think it's difficult to kind of preempt. Okay, I think we'll call it a day there just because it's been a lengthy session. Right, okay.